Welcome to Our Compose Cast, where we discuss productivity, self-hosting, career professionalism, and innovative technology. Here to bring you the latest from the open source ecosystem and beyond is yours truly, Andrew Syriac, and with me is my co-host, Jack Moore. How you doing today, Jack? I'm doing well. I'm just hoping we can get a uh, better picture in this week than last. I was showing my uh, grumpy face, but I'm doing well over here. I'm doing a lot better than Facebook and Twitch are right now. How are you doing? Oh boy, yeah, tons, tons of that going around in the news here. Uh, did you want to touch on those first? Because those are those are definitely the more popular uh, news items from the the past two weeks here. We can definitely start with them. Hit hit and heavy first. Facebook. I think it was uh, after so Sunday night there was a whistleblower kind of going out and leaked. I think a bunch of documents. You're gonna have to correct me on that. I, I'm not too familiar with what was leaked or what was said um, about the internals of Facebook. But sure enough, Monday morning, bright and early Monday morning around noon, uh, nine o'clock Pacific time, uh, we have a router change (laughs) and go figure, (laughs) I guess something was pushed on the router where they just stopped, uh, what, broadcasting their autonomous systems number, I think is what it was, their routes. Basically just went under. Sure enough, caused an issue with DNS because guess who runs their DNS from their own services? Facebook. They run everything from their own services. So huge problems. Uh, Cloudflare, Cloudflare wrote a nice write-up on basically kind of how the internet is one complex web of systems that really is when we boil it down, kind of fragile, kind of fragile and kind of complex. So uh, they had this nice write up on what, you know, BGP, what happened, uh, their own traffic, which they ended up not crashing because all of their DNS was able to scale and just do font, do just fine. But down for six hours, DNS, they, it's, it sounded like they were locked out of just about everything. It sounded like because they use their own services to run their internal facebook uh they were actually physically locked out and the fob system was broken because they used their own servers for that so i don't know found the whole thing kind of ironic it totally sucks to be behind all you know having to fix that and be someone kind of on the front lines doing that work but uh man i, I no good no good um don't know I if definitely you any- saw posts that that as i said if anyone lives close to a Facebook data center, please reply. (laughs) Because as you said, they had physically locked themselves out of their own data center and could not access any of their internal systems because they were all based on the DNS, which was no longer propagating correctly. Um, and as you you link to, I, I think the the best write up uh, thus far on it. Facebook has a announcement, you know, that something went wrong, and they're looking into it. And and uh, I I hope we do see something from them, as they are one of the tech giants. I mean, they they should be upfront and honest about what's going on. But it's Facebook. You know, they they got locked out of a lot of things, and and the downtime is catastrophic. I mean, the downtime they went from. Uh, it stopped being available around 1550 UTC and returned at 2120 UTC. Oops. Right. So that is just under six hours of complete outage of Facebook, WhatsApp, Instagram, and whatever other Facebook properties uh, they own. Terrible. And I, I, I think I saw a statistic. It was like $80,000. I don't know if it was 80000 or a million, but it was some it was absurd in, it was, number it was in, a minute. Yeah. That they lose, and if you're down for six hours, not a great look. Um, I think another not great, not so great look is Twitch. If you want to talk on that one, yeah. So actually, early this morning, I woke up to the news. Actually, in stand up, the very first thing that I heard was, "By the way, you know, some some British guy. He's like, by the way, did you hear that Twitch got hacked?" And I was like, "Oh no, <laughs> what's going on here?" Uh, and Later on in the day, um, around noon, they did confirm it. You know, t- Twitch took to Twitter, uh, ironically enough, and said that we can confirm a breach has taken pra- place. Our teams are working with urgency to understand the extent of this, yada, yada, yada. Um, 
Uh, I did link in the show notes the article to uh, on on the Verge, kind of confirming that everything that they reported on was correct. Um, some users are being asked to change their passwords. Um, it, it looks like everything that was leaked was uh, hashed um, as far as passwords go. Uh, they they had encryption. Let's hope they have good salting um, to to avoid you know rainbow table attacks and and stuff of that nature. Uh, I mean, I I would advise anyone just to go ahead and change your password on Twitch and anywhere else you have that password because they probably have your email address too. So if they are going to have your your email address and and spam password, that yeah. everywhere else, right? You, they're also going to spam that same password. So if if you're using that same password, if that password gets decrypted and they are able to use that to log into another service, I mean, that would be the first thing probably that would, they would try. That's a low-hanging fruit, at least. Uh, however, the, the breach included several other things, including three years' worth of details regarding creator payouts on Twitch. That was, a, saw that. That was an interesting one. Um, that, to me, is, is very much up in the air when it comes to um, knowledge wants to or information wants to be free, but information also wants to be valuable. Uh, so this is this is information getting free. Now we're gonna see how this becomes valuable. Uh, but also uh, by uh, by doing this, uh, Twitch became basically open source since it leaked the entirety of the Twitch.tv source code. So I, 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 that's not the way you want to do that. Uh, but it is momentous in that they they you can now see their internals, um, including an unreleased Steam competitor from Amazon Game Studios, yeah, uh, and Twitch's internal security red team tools, which is ironic since this is the result of a breach. It was uh, those I found those pretty interesting. There was also one more I saw that I liked, which was I think it's a proprietary. The way they, a proprietary streaming, um, I don't know if it was a protocol that was leaked, uh, but basically the way they format, it's kind of like what, RTMP, RTSP, the way they, is it the way they encode it and decode it? I, I saw something in there. I did not see that. I here, saw something in there about the way they, um, I think it was their transcoding is how it's, it makes it so fast, basically. But... Someone also posted, I, I don't know if you, they put it out on the Verge link, but someone posted a magnet link where you can pull the whole thing. It's like 126 gigs. You can just pull it down. So we're not going to include that in the show notes. Um, if you want it, you can probably find it out there. It's definitely out there. But just... I think this was originally leaked to uh, to 4chan. Uh, so if you want okay. to delve into the underworld there, <laughs> feel free to. I am good. Thank you very much. <laughs> now... And, and, and this is interesting because Twitch, as we know, was bought by Amazon uh, a while ago. Uh, and, and they're using internal Amazon tooling uh, and SDKs that aren't necessarily public. So, like, Lambda is public to us. Uh, but they it sounds like they're using some internal stuff that's not public, as, as some, some cloud services uh, that could help them, give them a competitive advantage since they are they are. Uh, under Twitch and and I keep saying you know I've I'm hearing these these rumors about like this this influx of acquisitions, uh, uh, which is which is what we see in uh, since uh, acquire, acquiring Mailgun uh, as well. Um, I'm I'm assuming you saw this uh, too, Jack. I think you had seen some said something to me. Uh, I did. I don't know. I don't know if, about this. Yeah, I don't know if it's. Uh part of what you mentioned last episode i think it was you that mentioned this uh where it's going to be a lot harder to acquire companies so i think we're just going to see a big kind of grab uh for ac you know acquisition acquisitions and uh i did see this i am trying to think of anything of note here um going through it just sounded like I, I don't have a great take on it. If you have anything you want to say or mention well, on it. Well, this is, we had a conversation several episodes back uh, about best of breed uh, applications, uh, right? Where, where applications try to be one thing um, for everyone. 
or yeah. they, well, they, they, they try to be everything for everyone and then fall flat on their faces. Uh, and as you start to scale up by acquiring all these different kind of services, uh, it sounds like Cinch is part of a kind of communication type of, uh, service. I, I'm, I'm not even sure really what they are, uh, trying to offer. I haven't really looked into it, but, uh, I, w- I would say that they're, they're trying to become a quote unquote international communications powerhouse serving enterprises like Nespresso, Toyota, and Macy's around the globe. So it, it, it just sounds like a, it, it's an interesting acquisition because I mean, there's tons of messaging services. Why would you, why would you want to corner the market on something that's so big and at least the, the small scale uh, deployments as, as mail gun. I, I mean, you're, I would, uh, unless they have a competitive a- advantage that they can only get by acquiring it, not simply using it. Like if they're that big, I, I honestly haven't heard of them before, but, um, we'll see if this, like many other acquisitions leads to a, a breakdown and stagnation and, and competition rising up. So, I mean, I would keep my ear to the ground to see if any male gun clones start showing their faces. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this one's also interesting. It's right off the uh, tails of MailChimp getting acquired. What was that by Intuit? Yep. We talked on yep. last episode. So we use both applications. We use MailGun in um, Command Center and Portal for the excellent API they provide. And then... Every week, if you're not on the mailing list, join the mailing list. We send out our newsletter and podcast promo and a lot of our promotional materials through MailChimp. So I can vouch for both services. They're great. I just hope we don't see kind of a uh, stagnation in both of them. What we haven't seen a stagnation in is uh, Docker, uh, despite their financial woes. No. (laughs) No. Uh, seen as the Docker con- Compose V2 engine uh, has come out to here with the release of V2.0.1. And this one was pretty crazy. This one, there were a lot of changes in this considering they rewrote the entire code base in Go. So mm-hmm. I saw that as a major update. They, all, It's also, I think I saw, I'm going to look at the release here. They don't release it as a single binary anymore. I think it's I'm going to look here. It's dependent almost on Docker kind of interweb as another tool. So if you look at it, instead of using the Docker compose with a hyphen in the middle, it's Docker space compose now. So very interesting. I I really don't know uh, what to expect from this or how it's a major change, right? It's a 2.0 release. So really going forward, we're going to see how it, how it goes with compatibility it sounds That's an like an interesting point about the CLI because that that sounds like a lot of what I would like to see Ansible do because Ansible has like several different commands. It has Ansible Dash Vault, it has Ansible, it has Ansible Dash Playbook. Like, why aren't we having a single Ansible, Ansible command space. with the argument? Like, uh, Red Hat does a lot of these things. They have a subscription manager. Um, they have a ton of their like the satellite maintainer, the foreman maintained service. Uh, that have these like three parts like um, subject, uh, subject adverb, verb, or subject, yeah, subject verb, verb, adverb yeah. or something yeah. like that. Yeah. So I mean, it's it, it it makes more sense logically as you're you're walking through it on the command line. Obviously, I'm automating a lot of this stuff. All I'm worried about is interconnectivity with the existing tools that I use. Um, but I'm sure they've thought about that. So I'll see how this all kind of falls out. Um, I, I do use calls to this from Ansible from Python, yeah. so um, I hope they don't break connectivity, um, but we'll we'll see in the days to come here, yeah. Yeah, I'm reading it here. I, I found the line I was looking for. Um, the installation instructions for v, Compose V2 differ from V1, obviously, version. Uh, version 2 is mm-hmm. not a standalone binary anymore, and installation scripts will have to be adjusted. Some commands are different. And then they do provide a Compose Switch command to translate Docker Compose commands into Compose version two's Docker Compose. So I don't, to be honest, I don't know how that's going to work or where, I don't know if that just does like a fine check and then 
you know, replaces the hyphen with a space, but I don't know what to, we'll have to look into that one because I know we do use Docker Compose for standing up services. Or it'll be interesting to see how the maintainers go forward with this change. Yeah. Uh, and we are standing up some new services. Uh, you and I have been working on on that working on, uh, but I, th- I think we're going to hold off on, on that till next episode till, okay. till this is all finalized. Um, cause I think, I think we just kind of ran into some really dumb good luck. Uh, so I'm, I'm happy on, on, on getting everything kind of where it is. Um, but as far as the existing ones we have there, there seems to have been some updates and I, you know, you've been gathering these, so I'll, I'll let you go through these. Yeah. So the first one here, kind of a big one we haven't really talked about in a while firefly 3 released 5.6.1 which you'd think oh what are they releasing you know what's going on ldap so they offer a limited ldap functionality i believe he says in the release notes here uh this feature releases new ldap libraries your mileage may vary i love i just love that he has that in there that because that could mean anything right that could mean you get it fully working or that could mean uh, okay, I can get it to bind and, you know, a handful of users or, you know, one group is able to work or whatever. So he says in the same comment, make sure you back up everything. <laughs> Firefly 3 may create a new account for you instead of reusing the old one. There's no option for LDAP filters yet. Uh, and then the other big one is he's at PHP 8, which is awesome to see another PHP app, app out there uh, that, it we is. are deploying. Yeah. So uh, great to see that the code base is, you know, continue to be worked on, continuing to be updated. And LDAP is one of those functionalities for any application. If It's almost, I would say, required. It's almost required. I don't know if you have kind of that same opinion or you're under that same boat. But, you know, being able you to man- some- manage users. Yeah at that level you need you need something to be able to tie into whether it's ldap or oauth or or some kind of uh, authentication um integration yeah um and for what it's worth i know i had talked uh, i believe it was last episode on firefly 3 being on uh gitter moving over to to gitter.im um i'm in the room via my matrix.org uh account so that that works just fine you know I'm, I'm on element i'm able to see uh them them talking back and forth dealing with issues day to day so that's that's pretty cool that's very cool actually i think yeah that matrix bridge is pretty nice i'm it's in that nice. same nice. same boat as you uh the next one here is jekyll 4.2.1 you know we were talking last week i th- or last episode about this uh being kind of so end of life and <laughs> Leave it to us. Uh, sure enough, they are still working on this project. So the big change with uh, 4.2.1 here, I believe, was development environments. It was around development environments. Site URL was basically redirecting, have, causing people issues while developing, You know, causing places where this variable is used to have issues. So uh will be nice to use uh, and test out. I know, I think in the past, I've definitely run into this issue before, uh, where site.url was it, you can hard code it in the variables. And, you know, I was trying to string something along, create something with that variable and it's, it, it would only work in production. So basically you'd have to build it and then kind of serve it from Nginx. Whereas now they have it fixed to work for localhost. So kind of nice to see that out there. Uh, and then they have a couple other shout outs here. Uh, to some folks that were developing the fix. Uh, They called it a... There were some other regressions uh, that they talked about from, I think it was 3.9 to this new 4.2.1 release. So good to see them still fixing bugs, maintaining the code base, and, you know, even bringing in fixes for stuff that should have been fixed, but... Just good to see that. Well, yeah, and, and they're still listening to the community. They're still interacting with them. They're still being active there, and you're still bringing in fixes into new releases, and they're pushing them as, as uh, bug fix releases. And then the last one here, Nextcloud. Uh, they introduce 22.2.0, 21.0.5, 20.0.13, and then a new desktop client. To tell you what, I didn't go through this full release, Um 
I didn't see anything major. It looks like the, the biggest thing I saw was that users can now have multiple email addresses in in Nextcloud as contacts and that and that with that you're able to look up people by their name or username and then it shows those multiple addresses. So kind of a minor change, I would say. They also, you know, talked about 22 a little bit, moving to hub and everything. And I didn't see anything mentioned about the new desktop client. Uh, I think there was transfers that were uh, updated. It says transfers incoming shares from one user to another when transferring file ownership. So that that was a big change right there. So you're able to trans- transfer file ownership um, to new users. But Nextcloud, n- never a dull moment. They're they're always moving forward uh, with development. Is what I'd say. But for our developments, we have quite a few this month. If you want to kind of talk on those. Yeah, and the first one isn't necessarily a development, more so a, a fix that we had to do to work around some limitations on the infra- infrastructure that we use. Uh, so we use GitLab CICD, and they had an incident where their MTU was borked, or they had something going on with with uh, their what they routed through. Um, and there were several, what was it, clones or APK ads or stuff like that that were, were timing out? Yeah, it was uh, quite a few sites that were timing out. It was for Alpine. There were a couple Alpine images that were timing out on just getting the image itself. Um, running updates from within that image was having issues. And then the other one I, I saw specifically was Ruby Gems. So yeah. kind of any dependency that needed to be pulled in with a request uh, was just having all kinds of issues. It would basically cause the job to time out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and all the jobs were timing out at that point. So we changed the CICD to uh, change the MTU to be 1440, uh, which Jack found and, and implemented pretty quickly. So everything was, was built in again. Um, so that was, I linked to the portal one. Uh, but that was across several of our repos. We just added that in because we use CICD for, for several of our projects. Um, because what we were doing is we were trying to test uh, streaming input from Rundeck data. Uh, so to, to bring this feature parity to what we are doing with the commands receivable socket and what we're doing with the, uh, the you know, running stuff on localhost and, and streaming the output, we also wanted to stream stuff from Rundeck because Rundeck's running the same thing, getting the same output, but we are only getting it once the entirety of the job is completed. We right. want it now rather than than waiting on it. And uh, Jack was able to to put together some logic to uh, to basically grab everything that has been created since we last grabbed it, and then just keep doing that keep, until it right. ends. So that was that was really cool to see. Um, just a. You know, just working with APIs, working with logic, uh, looping over loop, looping over return values, and, and kind of figuring out the idiosyncrasies of how Rundex API works. Basically, it's robust. I'll tell you that they have. It's weird. I sometimes I really hate it because they have all these different versions that you have to make a call to, like you know, slash Rundex slash API slash eleven, or slash Rundex slash API slash thirty four, and You'd think it'd be one nice, you know, Rundeck API projects, Rundeck API jobs, Rundeck API executions, you know, with IDs after all of those. No, it's like some rand, similar to their name, it's just some random ID after. And it's like, okay, it's, you know, Rundeck API 11 jobs. And so some of it still confuses me, but it is, it comes back in JSON and it just works. So it's nice. It does. That's all I need. It does, yep. uh, and and it it stays consistent. You, you get a heads up as to when stuff gets deprecated, and and it's it's fairly like you said, it's it's robust. Speaking of robust, we're, I think we're making our way towards it with being able to run we our, are, our, our in, compose in, on localhost. Yeah, yeah, in a way that won't require run deck. It, it will be enhanced by run deck, but won't be necessarily required by it. So we are currently. Uh, running our Compose instances on uh, localhost is what we initially had set up for a goal. 
And that kind of morphed into, let's run on anything that doesn't have any of our custom setup on it. So like if, if you had uh, root access to a server uh, and you have an Ansible set up somewhere, how would you use the R Compose collection to set up an instance for your own self? Uh, and, and really, could you do that? Um, so before this, the answer was no. You, you you could not. There were some things that were coded in there that would uh, be expecting a specific directory structure to be set up or would be expecting one of the variables outside of the role to, to be present. Uh, so everything that was tech debt, uh, I mean, it, it, it really was because because this obviously being our ultimate goal, right, to put out a, to publish a collection that, that anyone could run you couldn't run it unless you had, you know, the, the specified, you know, the secret sauce. So I was like, well, that's not right. Let's, let's kind of, let's clean it up. And, and really that's what it turned into just a, a big cleanup uh, project. So, so I cleaned up um, our, our project to be able to call our collection, uh, which had been updated. And then portal had a couple of fixes in there as well that needed to get applied. Um, just kind of some, some work, like I said, work, working under some, uh, technical debt assumptions uh, that we need to clean up, get ourselves a little bit more robust and be able to uh, to work in, in all kinds of situations. Uh, as part of that, I have written up a quick start section in the readme of the documentation. So it goes through, what is it, um, eight steps with one optional, uh, going from a blank VM uh, I don't go over like how to set up like SSH keys or get Ansible installed sure. on, yeah. on your own computer, but like the rest of it, how to install the requirements, uh, what playbook to create, um, optionally specifying the services you want to run, and then ultimately running the playbook against the host. Uh, that is all spelled out in our, uh, in, in the start of the readme and in the, in the quick start. So, uh, I was, and actually, Jack, you pushed me towards, towards writing up that quick start too. I hadn't even thought about that myself, but I was like, absolutely. And, you know, that's, that's one of the first things I, I look for, uh, you know, how do I get started on this? And, uh, it's a collection. So I kind of assume that, you know, you have Ansible set up and ready to go, but it really, if you just like the idea and you want to get going somehow, this is the way that you're going to do that. Uh, so that was pretty cool. I was, I was happy. I was really happy to get that because that is something I think we've had a goal for the last two quarters to get to that point. Uh, so it, it finally kind of came, uh, yeah. emerged out of, of what we were doing, all of the, the, the stuff we've been slogging through with, with portal and Python and, um, the, all these Docker containers and, and, and everything trying to get all this set up, uh, really kind of all came together, uh, with just really a, a minimal amount of cleanup. Uh, to be done on the actual collection itself. And, and now, you know, we can have, um, basically just a, a, a vanilla instance. Um, it's, it's not amazing. Um, you know, there's a lot of security holes deploying it like that, as you know, sure. you would expect. Um, for instance, all the passwords are test password, um, to all the services and the root database password is, is also that. It doesn't set the root password of the server to, to test password, luckily. Um, but everything else is, is basically insecure by default. So, uh, we can, we can go about looking to, to fix that, but that's adding complexity on top of it. I just wanted a really easy way to get, get going and say, you know, if I wanted to have the most minimal playbook, and, and if you look in the quick start, it really is the, the playbook is literally call the role and optionally specify the services that you, you want to have in your instance. And then you're off to the races. Yeah. Not to, cheap out but isn't it four or five lines four yeah. lines because it in include yeah. it just includes the galaxy repo and just yep off and running yep which is awesome i i'm excited about that yeah um and and in the documentation too i do point out uh all the passwords that should be updated how to do that how to put it in a vault how to you know the the whole nine yards so this shouldn't be like a surprise to anyone or, you know, and, and, and this shouldn't be too difficult for someone to figure out who wants to deploy it. Uh, what other variables do I need to set? Right. And then it's at your discretion, how you want to set them. I mean, we have a way of doing that. We use, uh, a pluggable environment, uh, kind of subdirectory, 
uh, sub repo type thing, and it works amazing for us. I, I I could not have asked for for a better system uh, to be set up, but I want to make sure that whoever picks this up uh, has the ability to create something better, something that I wouldn't have thought of. So I'm just gonna I'm gonna leave it as is for now. It's it's working, uh, and hopefully we can use the next quarter and, and you and I are going to be talking about this uh, coming up shortly here, but you know, we're going to use the next quarter to do something with that. What it is. I'm, I, I don't know yet, but we have this momentum. I, I am yeah. certainly not going to let it die. Yeah. Uh, the title for, for this episode is decking unemployment. Um, and that's a very bad pun. <laughs> it's not good in the least, but uh, today um, we are going to be talking about jobs. Um, so if you're concerned about unemployment, this is the episode for you. Well, maybe not necessarily because we're not talking about that kind of job, but knowing about Rundeck jobs might help you get a employment job. So listen carefully. Uh, I'm, I'm about to, I'm about to school you. In, oh, goodness. In how to get over unemployment. So Rundeck has a concept of jobs. And uh, today we're, we're going to go over that and, and we're going to see how jobs, uh, are, are really the core functionality of Rundeck. Last episode, we went over projects, and, and that's mainly how Rundeck the application is organized, how Rundeck the application can split up responsibilities, can can segment uh, access into different things. Uh, but Rundeck jobs are really the things that Rundeck as the engine uh, is is meant to run. So these are the scripts. These are the automations. These are you know everything that you're you're doing in Rundeck is going to be triggered by a job. So I am, as usual, going to defer to their documentation, uh, which I link in the very top of the the page here, and it says this chapter. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this, this chapter covers how to run and create jobs. So they have they have plenty here. They have way more than we do. And I'm I'm really only documenting in Bookstack what we do and how we do it and and what I'm knowledgeable about. And they have they have a lot more uh, to it. And they go into a lot more detail on it. Um, but I'm going to walk through a couple things after reading this introduction f- in their manual. So they say why create a job. Uh, and it says one might find a certain command executions are done repeatedly and perhaps represent what has become a routine procedure. Another user in your group needs a simple self-service interface to run a procedure across a set of nodes. Or routine processes need to be encapsulated and become the basis for other routine procedures. So these are all jobs we can we, 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 we have a trend here, and, and I like that they point that out in that uh, a lot of what they're describing here is stuff that is already ongoing, uh, in which the process that is ongoing, they would like to encapsulate or automate yeah. or, or something of the sort. The last thing you ever want to do with automation is go from zero to 60, right, in the blink of an eye. You want to step your way through your gears as you rev up the engine of this car analogy. Uh, so you you want to you you want to not not jump into the automation straight away, right? You, you, you want to see how things actually happen, how things fall out in reality. Because if you don't you don't see that fall out in reality, you could be months down the road in, in automation or or putting stuff together and you just find out well this this just plain out doesn't work. Right. Um, and by doing that manually, the, at least the first couple times, you can say, "All right, this is kind of a sustainable process." Especially if you you do it looking, you know, forward looking towards, you know, I would like to automate this in the future. How can I, you know, what are the things I need to uh, to uh, extract, right? Uh, and what is some of the variation that I can kind of take take out of this and I can say, well, it's always going to be named this way and we're just going to do it that way because not just because I say so or because, you know, I'm a, I'm a tyrant, but because that is what is going to enable us to automate this is, is by standardizing uh, what we do routinely, right? And instead of it becoming, you know, a, 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 a craft or becoming a, a bespoke, 
uh, method each and every time that, you know, one person is responsible right. for, you know, make it something that's repeatable um, and that you do over and over again and, and multiple people do over and over again to kind of uh, check, you know, what your assumptions, right? So you can get that feedback. And then I think at that point, you have a good solid foundation to look into something like Rundeck Jobs and say, how can we encapsulate this routine process? Um, how can we uh, put this routine job uh, into some kind of automation, right? So that being a long-winded explanation as to what jobs are, where can we find them? Uh, so the jobs link uh, is on the left-hand column. Uh, and that will take us to a listing of all the jobs in the project, right? So, so inside of a project live all of the jobs. Uh, from there, all the runnable jobs are displayed in alphabetical order in their job group. And uh, I have a picture in the documentation here that highlights uh, where the link to the project jobs are, where the link to the project groups are, and the runnable jobs themselves. Uh, it's, it's just easier to think about job groups as folders and runnable jobs as files, right? I mean, that's, that's what you're going to be looking at. You're going to be looking at what essentially looks like a file system with folders and, and jobs inside of those folders. Uh, note that if you don't have a folder, they're going to be displayed at the bottom underneath all of the job groups. So you don't have to have job groups. You don't have to have those folders, but they do come in handy if you want to organize what you're doing. Uh, now to create a new job, uh, at the, the top right under job actions, uh, there's an option to add a new job. And, and that really only requires two things. It requires a job name. And it requires something to do. Uh, it requires a step in the workflow. I love it. Yeah. Uh, okay. So I quick anecdote here. Uh, when I was testing out actually the commit for uh, streaming input from run, put, run deck data, what I wanted to do, I didn't want to run any of our production infrastructure changes or jobs on this instance because I knew it would basically either send it back to a state I didn't want it or it would send it to a new state where it's just completely wiped the stuff, completely wiped the instance, or it would delete the instance or what have you. So what I did, I went in, I created a job and the job was one, it was a one liner. It was a for loop or a while loop. It was a bash do while that ran, I think a hundred times and it slept five seconds. So Nice. Something easy, something quick, but it was when you talk about a definition, a job definition, it can be one line. It can be echo hello. So, yeah, everything else besides that, uh, like I say, is is optional. Strongly suggested. Totally. But optional nonetheless. Uh, so, as as we go through Rundeck, I mean, this is a very very complicated piece of software. Uh, so we're, we're trying to break it up as as best we can. Uh, so the, the rest of this documentation here is when you're creating a job or going to edit a job, what are the sections that you're going to come across? Uh, so the, keep in mind that that's how we uh, break this down. I have one, two, three, four, five, six uh, sections to go over here. Uh, we're going to obviously spend the most on workflow and the actual meat and potatoes of it, but we've yeah. got a, a couple other things to, to cover as well. So the first uh, tab when you go to edit a job is the job details itself. Uh, this is fairly simple. This is the job name, job group, and the job description. So job name shows up on the main jobs page. The job group uh, are those sections on the main jobs page, like the folders, like we were talking about. And then the description actually does show up on that front page too, as, as small text uh, under any given job uh, on that, on that jobs page. Yeah. Uh, now the job group does have the ability to browse any existing job groups that you have. Uh, if you want to create a new job group, you literally just put in any name that you want and it will be created for you. Uh, and then it will also be an option going forward for all of the new jobs or all the uh, other jobs if you go and edit them uh, to choose that group as well. Uh, so it's pretty free form. I had to figure out, you know, I, d I don't have to create one beforehand. I can literally just, just create one the, as I create yeah. that job. Yeah. Uh, and then the next thing we want to go into, and this is probably going to take the rest of my time here, but the, the workflow, right? 
Uh, so job workflows, uh, the job's most basic feature is its ability to execute one or more steps. The sequence of steps is called a workflow. The steps of the job's workflow are displayed when viewing a job's detail from the job listing or within the job editor form. So as we're, we're talking through going to the job editor form, we're going to talk about the workflow here. There are several notable sections to the workflow. Um, and uh, each change, uh, as you you are editing stuff on this tab, uh, each of these these subsections uh, will prompt you to to save uh, any new entry um, before you can save the entire thing. So if you if you are making different changes here, there, and everywhere, and scroll down to the bottom of the page and hit save, uh, that will actually not save you. It will prompt you to run back up and, and save the other. I've thing. run into that, and I I was hitting save. I hit save on the job or the workflow i'm thinking okay this is fine what's going on i'm thinking i hit save again it pops up with a little yellow error you have not saved you know whatever i didn't read it because i just was being lazy i hit save again it didn't go again like what is going on here i undo all my changes i hit save it doesn't go i hit cancel i'm thinking all right what's going on with this workflow what the heck's the problem finally take my time to sit down and in that workflow part it forces it. There's a little tiny save button right there that you have to click. Sure enough, you save the workflow and it goes. And I'm like, oh, well, of course. So, so that that is yes required as as you have found out. Uh, but it, I don't know how they do it. You, you said before that Rundeck feels like a UI that's been wrapped around an API that's been programmed. Yeah. And this is one of the things I think where that really does stand out. You say, all right, why is it expecting me to save these small sections when I would expect to just save the big page? And it's like, well, that's how the API was coded. Like that's, it expects a new variable. You're going to save that new variable and you're not going to save everything, you know, as, as part of one post. So now talking about the, the options, um, these, uh, the, the first section in the workflow, uh, these are arguments or variables that are set when the job is run. Uh, so inside of the options, uh, some of the interesting things to set are the name. Uh, and this is actually the name that you're going to be using when you pass it to different steps uh, as a variable and how you encode it and, and, and uh, how it gets invoked. Uh, and then the label which is actually the prompt that you see when you go to run the job. So the label is the human readable part of it. Think of it, uh, you know, like you have a label maker and you totally label all of your cables in your data center meticulously. Sure. Um, as one does. Uh, that is the human readable part of it uh, that gets plugged into the, the you know, whatever high number port, right, that no one's going to remember, but they're going to remember, you know, uh, this name. is Facebook's DNS manager. Do not <laughs> unplug. So that when someone unplugs it, you know, they get right out of the wall. Oh, that was the main router, <laughs> main edge router. Yeah, <laughs> and I know that because that's what the label says. <laughs> Uh, and then let's see other other options here for arguments and variables input type uh, so they have three types uh, they have text uh, and they have password which I would expect they also include date so like you, they have a they have a custom way to to pass in the date I've never used it because I've never had to uh, but I don't I don't know how that gets passed or if you're able to manipulate it in a special way. I'm not sure. It's just I find it odd that they would have a separate date field rather than literally just anything else. More text yeah. or yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so you can choose if you want it to be a text, uh, a, a encrypted password, or a date. Uh, and then one of the other things that I use is the allowed values and the restrictions, and I use those in tandem. So the allowed values are a comma separated list of values that you can enter, right? Um, and the restrictions on them uh, can enforce from that list or can allow anything, right? So uh, especially handy in like a, uh, a, a variable that uh, produces a, a checkbox list, right? Where you want to check, you know, multiple um, entries, you would uh, enter in those allowed values and then you would restrict them to only anything in that list. Uh, similarly, a, a drop down, like a true or false drop down, uh, you accomplish that by including true and false as the two allowed values and then putting the restrictions as, you know, enforcing from the allowed values list. 
so those two work in tandem to allow you to create these these constraint and that's why you know you, you start to see this as a as a part of self-service right you say all right i'm only going to allow these three kernel versions to be listed or uh this is only going to be true or false or this is For only going to be up till 10 oh these applications are going to be listed yeah, yeah. Uh, so this is this is where you know you, you talk about run being able to to share stuff with other people you know you say uh this is how you constrain their ability to to choose to shoot themselves in the foot right yeah it's it's basically saying you have a you have a a, a range of motion that does not include you your have foot. the gun yeah right right so um and moving on from from the variables we have the workflow control uh so this is uh these are these are kind of peripheral options as far as like what happens if you run uh, what happens about the the meta run itself so like if a step fails, what do you do? Uh, you have the option to stop immediately, or you have the option to run everything else before you fail. Um, you have, how do you want to execute it? Given that run deck is supposed to be run on, or is able to run on multiple nodes at the same point, do you want to run node by node by node, or do you want to run them all in parallel? Um, how, how do you want that to be executed? It doesn't matter for us because we're only running on one node, which is localhost. Uh, but they do have a handy like explain drop down, which will give you demos of like what does what do these three options yeah, actually right. mean? So that's that's pretty cool. Uh, and then the also global log filters, of which I uh, use one and am interested in looking into the other, because uh, one is masking passwords. So uh, like we were talking about before, if the input type of one of your variables is a password then you can actually mask that in the output. Run deck will see that, oh, this this plain text that was output matches the password that I passed in there. Let me redact that so that's not available to whoever's viewing the log. Um, and, and this is especially handy because we have stored passwords in Run deck, and those stored passwords also get passed to the executions. It's not a password that we put in every single time. Those are also redacted for us. So that's that's doing the rest of the work to kind of secure ourselves uh, against uh, the the stuff that uh, having to enter theory. a password every time. It's just one more field, yeah. right? Something else. It's one more thing exactly. to mess up. Exactly. Um, and then we come to the most important part. So these are the steps. Right, so these are the where the actual executions are structured. Um, there are a lot of options and ways to construct this. So I'm only, like I said before, I'm only going to lay out what I'm familiar with. Um, so they have two different ways to run this, and it's uh, it's node steps, which are run once for every node, and workflow steps, steps which are run once per workflow. Now, once again, since we're only running localhost, this really doesn't it's... mean much to us. Um, but the node steps uh, include a script, uh, like being able to run a shell script, uh, if if we had that, um, and also a command. So that's running a command from the command line. Now that is ninety percent of what we're doing here is is running commands. We don't run the built-in Ansible playbook um, because we want we have an execution prep, which sets up our directories ephemerally. Uh, with the file structure hierarchy that we want to see, we basically run a command to CD into that directory and run Ansible playbook uh, by hand with custom arguments, right? Now, one thing that we could do to enhance that functionality is by writing a plugin that would do all of that for us within the plugin with us simply supplying the variables. Cause right now we're writing out, you know, handcrafted shell scripts and putting them into the, the command of, of run deck, which is not what that's really supposed to be. It's really more so supposed to be just a simple invocation uh, of a command. And we've really been squeezing that one for all it's totally. Worth. Um, so, so the right thing to do would be to look into how Ansible Playbook uh, adopts its its functionality, or look into writing our own plugin uh, to do that. But 
most of our steps are, you know, easily accomplishable by running shell scripts. I mean, the first one we do is we run the execution prep script. Uh, the second one we do is we run the Ansible playbook uh, script. And the third one is we run a small cleanup command that will remove that directory structure. Because like I said, these are ephemeral directories. Uh, any kind of paper trail we would want is going to be uh, kept in the job log with all the secrets redacted, you know, so, so we are, we're going through and trying to clean up after ourselves, not leave any kind of a, uh, a trace that could, could help, you know, someone, someone pop our instance or something like that. Um, so definitely something, you know, we're, we're trying to be security minded about this. Uh, and as much as I, I rag on us for, for doing it, you know, the, the dirty way, it gets exactly done what we need it to get done. Uh, and, and no more. That's the good job of any tool, right? It does what we need it to do. We use it the way. We use it the way they provide it to us. How about that? I, I won't say we use it as intended because I know they, they, it seems like a big tool for going out to nodes and then running scripts on nodes, whereas we just we're running this thing locally on the box that Rundex on, and we're gonna do what we need to do with Ansible. I mean, I've said it once, and I'll say it again. But we, you know, we use this as as a replacement for hands on keyboard. Yeah, right? this is our automation front end, right? If I have to, if I have to run, you know, five different commands over and over and over again, well, no, I don't because I've already it's automated. automated. It. No. Yep. Yeah. It's automated. So. This is this is a, a replacement for that, and it's so easy to simply throw in a um, a command. You know exactly how I would be typing it in. You know, and, and and variabilizing what I can. When it gets to a point where it it does become too wieldy, right? Or uh, one of the other things I was thinking about is where it would require like a massive change across all of the uh, all of the nodes. At that point, that may be. Uh, functionality to say, hey, can we write a plugin that would abstract all of this for us? Right, right. And then we just run that. Um, so, so something to something to consider. But I mean, we we're not running into that yet. We we've got other things that we want to get done on the plate. Yeah, yeah right. Plenty right. of other things uh, for for us to do in our time. Uh, so, with the remaining five minutes, uh, I'm going to run over the other four uh, sections here. But I wanted yeah. to to uh, quickly stop and, and see if you had any any input on that or any questions. No, I think we talked about it already. The hand, you know, we use it the way it's intended, maybe not the way it's intended, but it fits our case, right? It does what we yeah. want it to do and need it to do. That's all I had. That's really all I had. Exactly. So uh, as I said before, uh, we run locally on our nodes. Um, so there is an, a whole section about nodes and, and about how to do that. And I'm going to skip that entirely because literally we only run a local host and it works just fine for us. Uh, the next is a schedule, which we actually talked about, I believe, last, uh, last episode, but you're able to, uh, run it repeat, repeatedly. Um, and you're also ena- able to enable scheduling and enable execution entirely. Um, so you can actually disable execution um, by by that logic. You can actually disable execution of a job and still have it present, right? You could just say, this isn't going to be run right now. Now, where that would come in handy, I think we were talking about this, but um, if you wanted to put something in maintenance mode, you got to say, I want to disable any future runs of this for the next two days, right? You would, you would disable that execution, do what you have to do, and then re-enable the execution. Um, so that's where I could see that coming in handy. Uh, next section uh, I really don't use, so I, I copied the link to the documentation from Rendek about this, uh, but notifications, uh, right? You can notify on start, on success, on failure, on retrieval failure, and on average duration exceeded. And Lord help me if I notify on average duration exceeded because that is a shot in the dark by Rundeck. But <laughs> it's so av- well, it's average duration is not. It's it's a terrible metric. It, why aren't percentiles it used? I, I could go on. I can go on and on about you know your ninety ninth, your ninety fifth percentiles are going to show you much so much more than oh this is the average duration. Well, that doesn't meet 
that doesn't mean anything yeah. to me. What? Why? Like, yeah. I don't care. Fine, fine. It takes well, five and, minutes on and average. I had what a, happens until you know the job that goes two hours? It's like, well, that just blew the average out of the wall. You know, the average out. But yeah, it, I I had a I had a talk. Uh, I think it was at two years ago at it, at Ohio Linux Fest, and I was talking about doing basically CI/CD testing uh, and looking at. Uh, metrics and figuring out, you know, where, where where infrastructure as code needs to be tested and maintained and, you know, analyzed. And uh, I, I got that question, you know, is the tool, you know, the front end, the automation front end you're using, is that not providing you, you know, enough data? It's like, well, I could scrape the data, like the data is there, but it does not have the tools to analyze it. Like you said, you get a lot more actionable information from the 99th to 95th percentile right than a strict average right so. yeah it'd be interesting those notifications i don't know if i strictly use them in the api in the api web hooks i know are available for jobs which we were kind of doing early on uh we've since moved away from them but those I know you have them listed here as notifications. They also come in as statuses as well. So you can, mm. when basically when you're pulling the API and the, the job itself, you can say, what what's the status of this job? And obviously there are a bit different ones. Um, you know, it's start running, aborted. There are a handful of other ones, but it's kind of the same as notifications. Again, with notifications though, fine send me any you know you can send me an email if you want i i don't know what i'm gonna yeah. what am i gonna do with this I, I i probably kicked off the job if it was something you know maybe if you're in a large organization it's gonna show up uh, as something that's maybe more useful but again maybe not so they're out there they're available i have more email filters than <laughs> i care to mention yep yes yep yep uh, and lastly, since I'm, I'm just about at time here, uh, there are a couple of things under the other tab which are interesting, uh, namely the log level. Surprise, surprise, debug log level produces more output. Uh, that's certainly helpful while debugging, um, and it's it's nice to be able to have in there, but it's not nice if you're trying to parse the information no. like Jack is. Nope. Yep. Uh, multiple executions, which I didn't know this was a switch until I needed it to be a switch. Uh, so allow this job to be executed more than one time simultaneously. Um, sometimes you don't want that. You know, sometimes you really only want one of these things going at once. Uh, we have many different instances that we definitely want on a recurring basis uh you know th that can be kicked off at any time simultaneous to any other time and that's kind of why we have the setup too right all these ephemeral you know directory setups that we do those are so that we can have these side-by-side -side executions right if if i'm executing something in one directory i don't need that directory to, to disappear it. from right. underneath me right i know that my my separate job executions are going to be in separate directories uh next we have the timeout uh, and, and you can time out a job, uh, retie, uh, retry, excuse me. Uh, and then the default tab, which I found since we only run one execution, uh, well, an execution on one node on localhost, uh, that it's best for us to change to the log output. And that shows us exactly what you would expect to see in like the console if you're running it from the command line. Uh, so if if you're looking at this and you're asking yourself why do I have to you know go through three or four different clicks to get to like the console output what I would be expecting to see go ahead and go to that other tab and change that default tab to log output and you should be golden. Yeah, I don't have anything else to add. Rundeck is a very highly visual uh, tool. I notice as I attempt to explain this going forward. Uh, I'm going to have fun going through the, uh, the, the integration session videos. Uh, those, those are going to be nice, uh, walking, walking through some of those, but there is just so many minute details, right. To, to all of this, right. To the jobs, to the projects, to, to everything that can be changed, tweaked and, and hacked around. Like I didn't, I didn't even say about, you know, how in the command step, 
Uh, if you want to double quote something, put three double quotes around it because that escapes the, you know, the double quote. All these just little things that you find out having worked with it, um, the way it uh, executes, you know, having having uh, a workflow that fails, but also cleans it up when something fails and then fails it, you know, having having that uh, on failure handler. Right. So there's there's tons of stuff to this and we just can't get that in depth with it because we just don't have the time really or the medium. This isn't necessarily right. the medium to get in that in depth with it. Uh, but if if this is something that you say my 50 <laughs> percent of my job, I would like to automate away, please. Right. I'm, I'm doing all these processes over and over and over and over and over again. Right. This is something we do have experience with. This is something we would sit down and say, all right, how are you doing this? You know, what variables do we need to control for and how can we get your process that you're doing on a repeated basis? How, how can we get that process into some automation? Um, because we would love to see you do more with what you have than you're doing now. Absolutely. I'm all on board with it. Uh, And you can do that by going to rcompose.com. Yeah. Or reaching out on the website, even if you know someone who's running into the issue or wants to automate something, direct them to the site. But I had a great lead in. You threw me off there with the uh, walk in with the uh, little pitch there at the end. Um, But I don't know, Andrew. I, I think if... Would you say you need Oz at the end? You got to walk down the yellow brick road for automation. I would say you don't. You don't have to. You're not going to have to. It's always, it's been right in front of you. You've got the golden shoes on. All you have to do is click them together. And I think we're here you to. Got the I think we're here to tell. On? <laughs> you got your automation shoes I'm so on. Confused. You just got to click them together. I'm so Wizard of Oz. Um, but once you've clicked them together. <laughs> You kind of get into this discussion of accountability. So, wait. So this isn't about automation. I'm so confused. No, it's not. It's about this book I read that I read the reviews and then got really mad about because I was like, oh, the, all the reviews are right. I'm I'm just so blind to it all, ignorant of everything. But what I did is I read the Oz principle, which is getting results through individual and organizational accountability. Basically, you could have taken this whole book, you could have crunched it into like 60 pages and called it a day, but no, this guy just wanted to ramble for 300. I love the first 60 page. I love the first, like, the first part. I'll say that I love the whole first part. The second and third part, he just kind of keeps going on. Even the reviews go kind of go into, you could take these principles and apply them to literally any book. You, you, you could pick out a thin air and... The, also, the book which just wasn't prescriptive. So, with all this being said, me kind of bashing on this thing, I would love to jump into it now. <laughs> Hopefully, I have your attention on why it actually does matter. Why the book was actually not as bad as I described it as. Um, first of all, the forward uh, last thing on bashing here. Uh, the the forward is <laughs> Victor Hugo once said, "There's one thing stronger than all armies in the world. That is an idea who is." whose time has come. When I first read this first one through the book, I was like, I was like, Oh wow, that's a great idea. I, was like, you know, I, I looked at it the second time. I'm like, Oh my gosh, why, 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 why? Okay, fine. That's just whatever. Right. Wait, wait, is, is the author saying that his idea is yes. great because Victor yes, H- okay. yes, 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 yes. And I'm, I'm just thinking to myself, this guy is just full of like kind of almost full of it's himself. Full of it. Yeah. Not full yeah. of it. He, there were some good principles and good stuff. It was a, the book's almost a great reminder on what accountability is. And mm. first thing I put in was this definition: it's rising above the circumstances and doing whatever it takes to get the results desired. And I, that's why I love this first part. It kind of says, it kind of asks you to look at yourself and say, "All right, what am I above the line or below the line?" This is this concept he describes as above the line is basically he has four four steps. It's uh, seeing it, owning it solving it and doing it and he later in the book he describes the characters in the wizard of oz as kind of these four steps goes into a couple examples but below the line is essentially doing these things and oftentimes 
what I loved about this book is that it's very easy for people who uh, operate above the line to fall below the line. And there are these kind of traps that you find yourself in below the line and it's ignoring and denying. It's not my job. You point the finger, uh, you act confused, and then you just say, tell me what to do, covering your tail and then waiting and sitting. So loved all of these because it's something I think everyone can find themselves falling into at times, even if you operate, quote unquote, above the line, mo- a majority of the time, you can find yourself falling under, falling s- circumstance, I, I don't want to say that, but falling below the line, basically you're doing one of these things. Um, the book wasn't very prescriptive on solving it all, It on providing a great solution, uh, and what I mean by that is, of course, he has these four steps, you know, see it on a solve it, do it. But he doesn't really talk about the how, I guess. He just kind of puts, was it, he throws them out there. Was kind of where, was it where it was. Was it not discussing it or was it like the the thoughts that he put out weren't exactly ones that were, were going to work necessarily? He just didn't, and, okay. didn't really discuss it. It wasn't really, mm-hmm. he provided... He put he put the information out there. It, it felt like he didn't drive it home as best he could have, and maybe that was just part of the writing style. But it didn't feel like there was like a punch down home solution or what is it? Pansia, a full you know full solution for it. Um, just kind of put mm-hmm. the. It was almost like he just put his thoughts out. Um, so. With this being said, part one was my favorite part. Uh, it kind of gets into getting results through accountability. I did put this whole massive blurb that I will just let you guys go through in the show notes. Um, That's a wall of text. Oh, it totally is. I, I loved it, though. Honestly, it's a complete wall of text. Uh, there's one line here um, that I did really like, which I probably should have just included the line, but I felt like the whole, the whole, you need you need the background, right? You need the background. Um, essentially it talks about the wizard of Oz, uh, the book recounts, here I go. I'm just going to read it. The book recounts a journey towards awareness. And from the beginning of their journey, the story's main characters gradually learn that they process, they possess the power within themselves to get the results they want until the end. They think of themselves as victims of their circumstance, skipping down the yellow brick road to the Emerald city, where they supposedly find the all powerful wizard that grants them wisdom, heart, courage, and the means to succeed. The journey empowers them. And even Doris, even Dorothy, who could have clicked her red slippers, that's where I was trying to get with my uh, <laughs> bri- segue. my segue, my bridge in. Um, even she is, uh, let's see here, unaware she's able to use them. Um, so he kind of gets into why people like it. Basically, it's people relate to the theme of the theme in the journey from ignorance to knowledge. Uh, so as you've seen in the wizard of Oz, right? Everyone already has these powers available to them. They just have to look down in themselves to find them. It, it, you know, the wizards behind the curtain, really it was in you all along to find it. Um, he goes to say here, unfortunately, even the most ardent admirers of, ardent admirers of the story often fail to learn the simple lesson, never getting off the yellow brick road, blaming others for their circumstances and waiting for the wizards to wave their magic wands and make all their problems disappear. In fact, the temptation to feel and act like victims has become so popular in American in America that has, that it has created a very real crisis. And this is kind of where he goes into the victim cycle. He basically gets into People blame their own problems. People blame others for their own problems. And uh, it says, you know, the majority of people in organizations today, when confronted with poor performance or unsatisfactory results, immediately begin to formulate excuses, rationalizations, or arguments when they cannot be held accountable or at least not fully accountable for their problems. So it's easy, right? You fall below the line. You just blame others. So, uh, 
He gets into the latest, most up-to-date management concepts and techniques won't help if you've neglected the basic principles to empower empower people and organizations to turn in exceptional performances. Don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Oh, that's a boy, lot. I don't know where to start. So the so the first thing that came to mind is um, recently I just read uh, Twelve Rules for Life uh, yeah. by Jordan Peterson, and one of his most famous rules uh, that likes to get lampooned a lot is you know clean up your room. Sure. Uh, so actually, in the book, it's not clean up your room, but it's set your house in perfect order before you criticize the world. Sure. There is a lot of of uh, reference to you know you know clean your room, start and small and whatever. He says, uh, perhaps you will then see that if all people did this in their own lives, the world might stop being an evil place. After that, with continued effort, perhaps it could even stop being a tragic place. Who knows what existence might be like if we all decided to strive for the best. And there's there's a lot that I've learned by taking accountability. I mean, and that's that's a vague overarching term, but like totally. Here's one, right? Um I realized that I had to lose 30 pounds like in order to to maintain healthy, right? Um I had to stop eating like crap and and uh, and and get healthy, right? Uh, I had to sleep, right? And and those are things I I have control over, right? And what you you find out, you know, cleaning your room, you know, getting a decent amount of sleep, you know, um, exercising, eating right, these all are not ends in themselves, right? These are habits you start cultivating. Right. Right. And you start cultivating the discipline that goes along with those habits. And that could branch out into other areas of life. Right. Um, similarly, taking accountability and changing the little things, you know, changing the little things in your little sphere of influence. Right. Uh, can set a precedent. Right. They could encourage others. Uh, you can you can do a lot by simply taking accountability for what's yours. Um, one of the things in The Wizard of Oz that people get distracted with is they see this this entire world and everything that's wrong in this world like the the evil trees in the forest that are throwing apples at dorothy they look at the evil wizards that are that are attacking them right and and there's a deep innate desire to want to put that all right but when you you let go and you say look there there are evil things in the world there are things that are beyond my control and uh, I can't, I can't do anything about them. That doesn't mean that I need to give up or ask for it from, from exactly. above. Yep. It means that what I can do, right. What I'm responsible for, I need to take care of, of my stuff because someone else, that is someone else's responsibility. And if I take care of my stuff and, and, and we, and someone else sees me taking care of my stuff and they start taking taking care of their stuff everyone starts taking care of their own stuff the guy who's responsible for taking care of that forest the, the forest keeper dude or whoever or the, it is the dude yeah. who's supposed to oil the tin man or like those things will also get taken care of right i i can't literally be all you know i can't do everything but i can do what i i can be accountable for and where that where that becomes increasingly frustrating is when you do see these things that trickle down to you that need to get fixed that are someone else's problem right and and you say how can how can i prevent the source of the problem totally. right how what action what heroic action do i need to take to, to fix, fix the source the of source. the problem right right and and turns out that your problem is that it rains and you should probably just get an umbrella rather than trying to solve weather <laughs> that's a good one <laughs> like just do your best for your own self, right? Take take care of your own self, your own things, the people around you. Stay t- start taking accountability and responsibility for that. Don't think it's going to be handed to you because I can guarantee you it's, it's not. not right. It's not. So don't think don't think the government's going to come out with a mandatory umbrella oh. mandate <laughs> and, and pass out umbrellas because it rains in the United States. You got to go out and get your own. Uh, but but once you do, I promise you you are going to be able to focus on the things that really matter, like your, your family and your friends and your house without having to worry about the rain. And I love that. The exam, the whole thing, the example too. Uh, essentially what we see though, and what this guy kind of points out in this somewhat dated book, I'm really just throwing the jabs in, aren't I? Uh, 
what this guy throws out is that people it's people find it easier to blame someone else or something else for their own problems. They don't sit down and evaluate. They would they'd go out and say, you know, you walk into work, why are you wet? It, well, it was raining. It, it was raining outside. It was I didn't know it was going to rain. It was raining out. It's raining outside. You don't have an umbrella in your car. You don't have an umbrella with you. Uh, and you're going to blame something else for your why you're wet. Why this is your not your problem when in fact it really is. And he yeah. basically goes on to just talk about all these organizations that they operate. They're accountable for, you know, 80% of their stuff. But unfortunately, it's like the 20% that comes in and just they operate below the line. It's like, oh, we lost hundreds of millions of dollars on. We didn't realize interest rates were going to change. So we based our, you know, forecasts and models based off of something we thought was never going to change. And sure enough, it changed. And they're like, well, why are you out of business? It's like, well, we're blaming we're blaming the government for these changing interest rates. Like, no, 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 no. You should have known in the first place that that was going to be your problem down the line in the future. Um, and and you're not going to be changing the source of the problem. Like right. you, you're blaming right. something. There's a there's a there's a negotiation technique. Um, there it's it's I forget the, what it's called, but it's basically like you're you're in a you're in a car dealership. Right. And the guy says um, a, a smart, a smart negotiator, smart car salesman will say, is there anything preventing you from buying this car today? Right. And one of the things you can do if, if he doesn't ask that question up front to weasel out, you can say, ah, well, you know what? Actually, I I got to run this past the wife or, you know, uh, the bank, you know, closed 30 minutes ago and I would have to ask them for, for a different price. So, you know what, I'm, I'm going to have to, to pass today. Right. And, and you're, you're pointing to a nebulous, you know, organization or, or someone who's unavailable to be, yeah. to be contacted or, or not a party to this. And you're saying, well, I'm actually not it's not my fault. Accountability. Right. It's not, it's not, my, not my fault. fault. It's right. not my problem. It's it's someone else's problem. I can't do this thing right now. I would love to, but I can't because right. of something else. That's that's not taking accountability, right? It's a it's a sleazy negotiating tactic that works, but it's still sleazy. Yeah. He has a couple more points in here. I, I'll just cover kind of his solution, uh, and then we can kind of wrap it up, but. There are a couple other quotes I also like. Those obsessed with the past are ignorant of the future. You know, people who obsess over the past, they they don't have the foresight. They're not going to, they're mm-hmm. just going to keep looking back and saying it's, it, it is, conti- I've continued to walk into work wet. I have not brought my umbrella. I'm trying to solve the weather right now. I'm trying to solve rain. It's like, just bring an umbrella to work. Um, but he does provide solutions um, in part two. And then, he did a shoddy job in part three. That's why I didn't really include any notes um, th- through others, basically. But part two is seeing it, owning it, solving it, doing it. And formatting it. And formatting it, of course. I will <laughs> have to go back and format. But seeing it involves recognizing and acknowledging the full reality of the situation. He describes this as the hardest step and the greatest hurdle because it's hard to take an honest self-appraisal and acknowledge that you can do more to get the results you want. And one of the things he kind of harps on in this book is feedback. Constantly get feedback on yourself. The way the way you see the world isn't the same way other people see the world. So he said, go out, get feedback. Go out, you know, ask what people think of you, your work, what you're doing. Get feedback on it because you have to know what other people are seeing through their lens versus you through yours. Uh, owning it is the means to accepting the responsibility for the experiences and realities you create for yourself and others. I think it could have been wrapped into, they could have been broken down differently, but I'll let it go. Owning it, obviously you have to own, you take, you, you, you accountability is 50% ownership, right? You have to take ownership. You're not, you're never going to become accountable if you don't own it. You can just point something out every day and say, Oh, well, I don't have to worry about, you know, don't have to worry about it. Um, so you have to own it and then solving it kind of entails, Changing reality by finding and implementing solutions to problems that you may or may, or may not have thought of before while avoiding the trap of falling below the line. So this is the one step, I think. So you said seeing it is the hardest, but solving it is the one step where you can easily fo- find yourself becoming the victim. Again, just pointing at others, denying, 
you know, putting your tail between your legs, falling kind of in the trap again, and then doing it entails mustering the commitment and courage to follow through with the solutions you've identified, even if the solutions involve a lot of risk, which I love because if you've solved it in a way, it, it, I'm not a very, I'm, I'd say I'm pretty risk averse. It's very easy for me to just stay and not, not risk. But, uh, I love the last step here is, uh, do it even if it involves a lot of risk. So <laughs> just kind of an interesting piece, yeah. but, um, six, he says success in business boils down to one simple principle. You can either get stuck or get results period case close. There's, and I'd agree with him. I don't think there's another, you get results or you're, you're stuck. So, um, part three goes into kind of groups. I, I didn't like the way he described this. There was one section he talked on, but it, it was mostly really about giving and getting good feedback and what that looks like and basically making sure to request it um, as much as possible on everything you do. So I'm going to have to go back and look through that. I didn't think it was, I didn't think there was enough information in that and I don't think I had enough time to cover it all uh, through this, but if you're going to take away one or two things is don't be the victim uh, of a situation that you can control. Basically, you can't point at something else for all of your problems. You have to take ownership and accountability for something that you can do. And um, the above the above and below the line, which is, you know, if you're below the line, you're basically becoming that victim. And above it, you're taking those necessary steps to get results. That's what I would say. But that's what I have for the book. It's a it's a weighty subject matter. There's a lot to cover. Not not just that, but it's there's. Would you say different principles out there? Yes. Right. Yeah. There's for there's accountability. Definitely yeah. A mentality that says I just want to be taken care of, or I just want to sit and do my job, or right. Someone else right. is going to come along right. and 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 totally pro- provide me the tools I need to do my job, or. You can take the stance that I have been provided both by God and management with the tools that I need to do my job. And it's up to me to do that job. You know, take taking that personal responsibility and saying, look, I, I, this may not be the perfect situation, right? This may not be the way I wanted it to be, but I am going to try my darndest to to make it work right um and and subsequently to make it better for everyone else around me that is ultimately what you want to keep in mind you want to you want to keep in mind the the fact that you know this is you're not serving anyone by complaining right you're not you're not doing anything by putting the putting putting the blame and shifting the blame on on someone else i mean it's you know ignoring and denying you know finger pointing um covering your tail Right. You're, you're just saying, hey, it's it's not my fault. You're not taking responsibility. Right. Um, and, and and I see this in a lot of uh, people who, who start using the, the, the big tech tools. I mean, it's I uh, something something happened. You know, I, I'm not responsible for this. I, I'm just doing my job. You know, that that's per right. the Nuremberg trials, not a defense. But we, we we as a society recognize that it's it's time to to take personal responsibility right and especially as we you know start forming into these these communities right communities won't take people who who are are, are toxic like this right and and that's what this turns into right you you turn into either a toxic workplace or a toxic friendship you know you you don't want someone who's always blaming you for the things that go wrong in their life right that's just not a a, a healthy way to to live your life right so you got to find some way to turn that around if if that's the path you're going down um and and you know maybe you see someone else who's going down that path and and it's it's hard i mean i'm reading a really good book right now uh the righteous mind um 
uh, by by Jonathan Haidt, and I'm I'm really excited to to go over it. I'm I'm hoping to next week, but it's it's really hard to to get someone else to to turn around. It's it's really hard to to get someone like you said to step back and see uh, to to see it. I mean that's that's step number one. You got to see, hey, I'm not taking responsibility for my actions. That is a sentence that not a lot of people are willing to to say or even come to the conclusion to say. Yeah. So so. I mean, the the more pressure you can you can start heaping on someone, right? In in order to help them, in order to serve them, in order to 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 make this a better world. I mean, share this show if if that's what it takes, right? Share that book if that's what it takes, right? Um, we'll be here. We'll be talking about this. We'll be going through it. Grab bag has kind of turned into you know moral compass hour. I'm I'm not against it. I like it. Uh, you know, I think there's a lot of soft skills in tech that are, are missing honestly and and you know we can get down to the bits and bites but that's not where the people live uh so so we're trying to be where the people live and and we will continue to to be here with with every with every episode and with that we hope you enjoyed this episode of our composed cast thank you be safe and we'll see you all in two weeks bye everybody